Reflection and land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the land we are on is part of the ancient homeland and traditional territory of the Lene Lenape people. We pay tribute to the Nanako Lene Lenape people, past, present, and future, and their continuing presence on the homeland throughout the Lene Lenape diaspora. We also acknowledge the millions of enslaved Africans and their descendants on whose backs this nation was created. Not in Our Town, Princeton is a multiracial, multi-faith group of individuals who stand together for racial justice and inclusive communities. Our focus is to promote the equitable tr treatment of all and to uncover and confront white supremacy, the system that facilitates the preference, privilege, and power of white people at the expense of non-white people and pits racial and ethnic groups against each other by upholding a hierarchy based on proximity to whiteness. Our goal is to identify and expose the political, economical, and cultural systems which have enabled white supremacy to flourish and to create new structures and policies which will ensure equity and inclusion for all. In our commitment to uncovering the blight of white supremacy on our humanity, we take responsibility to address it and eliminate it in all its form through intentional actions, starting with ourselves and our community. Thank you. Mickey, you're muted. Oh, okay. So, well, let's get started with the program. The title of the program is Vision of Racial Literacy, Student Lenses in Domination and Progress. The Racial Literacy and Justice class is celebrating its third year of knowledge building in the Princeton High School community. After an unprecedented year of racial domination, we celebrate our students as the key holders of racial progress. Tonight's discussions includes comments by the Princeton Public Schools Humanities Department Supervisors, Keisha Smith Carrington, um, who supervises the preschool through sixth grade, and Stephanie Greenberg, who supervises uh, the seventh through 12th grade. In addition, we have the racial literacy and justice teachers and students sharing their thoughts about the unique, unique state of the racial literacy and justice framework this year. And finally, student transfer products. The transfer product is their version of authentic assessment. It asks students to share their, their learnings as if sharing the light of their understanding with an unlit candle. We will ask you to widen your lens in the noise of the current moment, to see with open eyes, to hear with open ears, and to learn with an open heart. Now I'm pleased to introduce the instructors of the Racial Literacy and Justice class, Dr. Barnes Johnson and Ms. Patty Manhart. First, Dr. B Barnes Johnson. She's also known as Dr. VJ. And she's been a teacher at Princeton High School for the last 14 years. Her teaching assignments include chemistry and racial, just, racial literacy. She has enjoyed collaborating with Ms. Manhart and other educators to produce the current elective the newly required introductory course, and several other racial literacy programs for Princeton and various community groups. Now for Ms. Manhart. Patty Manhart is in her ninth year as a social studies teacher at Princeton High School. 
developing and teaching the racial literacy elective with Dr. BJ has made her a better history teacher and has been a highlight in her career as an educator. Now let's welcome Dr. BJ and Ms. Mann. Thank you, Yay. Mickey. <laughs> well, thank you. And I'm so honored to be here again with my co-teacher, uh, Mrs. Manhart, as we present the work of our students and the work that uh, we have done as a community to better understand our framework of racial domination and racial progress. We're calling tonight's presentation 2020 plus one, vision of racial literacy because we recognize that this year, that is the year between 2020 and this moment has been plagued with um, incidences of racial domination. And we wanted to take the time to celebrate how our students have persisted in spite of the challenges. Our opening slide presents our intent to talk about what a transfer product is, and that is to sort of transfer our learning. But I want to spotlight author, author and illustrator Sharon Ruddall as she has done some amazing work that has transformed me this past year. We will have an opportunity to talk with her again in November, but she is in, she's here tonight and I just wanna say thank you. So this art is um, in one of her recent works and uh, thank you for allowing us to use it. So this idea of widening your screen, I would like to actually start by having us stop and think about this, um, widening the screen. I would like you to also understand that our students may or may not have their video on, and I'm going to ask that you respect their right not to be seen. And I'm going to ask you not to screenshot any of the images that you see um, tonight as this is their intellectual and their emotional work. We will, however, ask that um, you reserve your questions, you mute your mic, and we will leave space toward the end to make sure that you get a chance to be in conversation with us and our students at the end. So what is this lens that we're asking you to widen and why is this such an important message? So we're going to take and watch this three minute um, teaser, uh, which is actually a commercial. Because when you stop and think about how is it that we learn about race, there are three primary ways that we learn about race. We learn about race within the context of our family and our intimate life. That is our church, our homes, our organizations, our mothers, our fathers, our aunties and their stories. But the most impactful for many children, the thing that creates fear in so many people is how they learn about race in the media. And so we're asking you with that to open uh, up this conversation and let's watch together. yourself why these are the black stories we've been shown wait what did i just do a narrow view that limits our understanding but there's so much more to see Black 
life. Let's widen the screen so we can widen our view. And I also appreciate that Dr. Barnes Johnson starts us with this video because the theme for this course is racial domination and also racial progress. So centering Joy, sorry, Joy, that that's also your name. So it just fits perfectly. Um, as part of this course is also, you know, an important theme for us to get into, you know, beyond just systemic oppression, which is absolutely something that we study, um, but also having those stories of progress and joy are just as important. And so we, over the course of this last year, have heard lots of language in the public square as it relates to race and racism. Um, curriculum that is anti-biased, uh, anti-racist, um, intersectional, critical, uh, what is critical race theory, and we are using all of that as a context of understanding racial literacy, choosing, um, again, to sort of deal with all of this swirling language as we uh, sort of feed, feed ourselves and our students receive from them in this conversation. And so with that, we would like to take a moment to invite our humanities supervisors both to sort of begin to have conversation with us about what's happening in our district. The idea that in the Princeton Public Schools, we're able to do so much of this work because they are lobbying for it is important. And we wanted to leave space in tonight's presentation to sort of understand where we are as a district and how it is that this work is happening. And so I will defer to Keisha Smith Carrington and Stephanie Greenberg, our supervisors of the humanities. Thank you, Dr. Barnes Johnson. And thank you all for um, the opportunity to speak tonight about what's going on in the younger grades. And so um, I always kind of chuckle because preschool is included in my title. However, um, there's a, a little bit of a different relationship with preschool um, for me than with the other grades that I'm responsible for. So in preschool, a lot of the work is just part of the curriculum that we've adopted. We have um, teaching strategies, gold as our assessment, and we use creative curriculum in the district. And both of those um, are based on the early childhood model that presupposes that culture and anti-bias, um, all of those pieces are included in the way that you are um, helping children to develop. And so there's a lot of intentionality, even in the model for positive behavior support, which is the pyramid model at the preschool level that really speaks to understanding yourself as an educator, um, making sure that the space is representative of all of the diversity in the classroom, and so there's a lot of steps that are just good practice and natural um, parts of preschool education. And so that's kind of this separate entity. And then we hit our K through 12 continuum, which of course they're connected through the standards. However, the approaches are very clearly delineated um, because of the fact that preschool has a, a separate kind of, um, of uh, way of approaching all of the practices that we are just learning to include at the K through 12 lens. So basically I said all that to say early childhood has been doing a lot of things right for decades and especially when it comes to diversity. And we are just starting to do that work intentionally in the K-12 continuum. So when we get to the um, this year for us, at the elementary level, K through five, we've been doing a lot of this work for making sure that we are focusing on um, social justice intentionally. And so we use the Southern Poverty Law Center's organization, which is called Learning for Justice. We use the social justice um, standards and the domains 
through our library courses this year. And so at the K through five level, every student in all of the grades and actually including preschool as well, if they're in district schools, um, they have library every week, sometimes once, sometimes twice. And those courses have been revised this year so that not only are we making sure that we are intentionally um, selecting titles that are extremely reflective of our world and the library media specialists just by virtue of their craft have been doing that kind of work for a long period of time. But we're being very intentional now of making sure that we're supporting the use of those texts to help students develop skills in identity, diversity, justice, and action. And so all of the texts that they've been reading, they learn to look at them with a critical lens, focusing on those different domains in the social justice standards. Um, that work is being woven in this summer into our social studies revision in the elementary level and at sixth grade, um, intentionally making sure that we are seeking to have that population and alignment. I see the play on words that um, Dr. Brown Johnson has included so that we are making sure that students begin to have an experience in the earliest of grades. So in preschool through their developmentally appropriate ways of learning and those experiences are beginning to be carried throughout. Um, in our elementary grades too, we have teachers who have completed our district's um, reframed equity professional development. And through a grant from a um, wonderful person, whoever it may be, who has supported the district's initiative, we are able to provide additional resources to help those teachers do this work in their classrooms with their students. Then we move into the middle grades. And this year, um, partially because of the pandemic and, and some opportunities that it afforded, we were able to add a Pathways to Racial Literacy course in um, PUMS. And so that course also aligns its work to the social justice standards. And so the students in that course um, have spent a semester. Um, we have had over 450 students, I believe this year, who will have completed our inaugural um, implementation of that course. And they are doing a lot of work um, building sophisticated understanding of racial literacy, um, developing the ability to talk about race, which is something that we don't do well in our nation, um, and developing the understanding of all of the historical implica implications for some of the social realities that we um, all live within today. And so that course has been um, very well received and the teacher for that course, similar to the elementary library media specialist has also had additional equity um, professional development to support her efforts. Then we also have a work that's being done to retool our elementary um, implementation of English language arts. And so in that work, we're making sure that we are being intentional about the texts that are being selected from this point forward. Um, we are looking to have texts that, again, reflect the diversity in our world. And so we have a lot of additions that have already begun to be developed and will be in our classrooms in September. So that's a lot of the work that um, has been happening in order to make sure that there is um, effort that is happening in every classroom and it is expanding at this point in the elementary grades from the library into the actual um, students general education curriculum through math and language arts, social studies and science. And so again, this was our first year um, of doing that work and we expect that to grow even more as we move into our um, summer PD where teachers will begin to get more support for culturally responsive pedagogy, culturally sustaining pedagogy. So ways of really bringing this work 
and this belief in um, acknowledging all of our students' identities and making sure that we're engaging them in critical conversations about race, gender, and sexuality. So we'll be doing all of that work um, in some summer PD and it will move into our classrooms even more next year. One last thing, and then I'll transition over to the, the higher grades. Um, we also, in partnership with Stephanie, my counterpart at the um, seventh and 12th grade level, um, our science supervisor and our middle school special education supervisor, we partnered to have um, Dr. Goldie Muhammad, who has um, a historically responsive literacy framework that she posits in her book, Cultivating Genius. Um, we had a study with her coming in to work with us and we will be doing some of the curriculum revision in social studies will be to integrate that into our instruction for the new school year. And so the whole premise behind that work is that um, we want to make sure that identity is at the heart. And then we also want to make sure that we are developing criticality, which is one of those terms in the swirl that Dr. Barnes Johnson had up a few minutes ago. And criticality really speaks to understanding the role that power plays and understanding inequities as they present um, historically and culturally. And so um, a lot of the things that we've been talking about um, both during the time I've been in Princeton and be, as I've learned um, for many, many years are um, becoming reality in our classrooms now um, through the work of professional development for our teachers, um, intentional selection of resources, and also some changes in how we um, actually uh, address different um, experiences that happen on a day-to-day -day basis in our world by preparing our teachers to talk about them. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for including me. Um, it's honestly, it, it's really an honor to, to be invited to speak um, alongside the racial literacy and justice students as they present their, their projects. This is always a, a highlight of the semester, um, getting to, to see what the, the students created. Um, so uh, thank you, Joy and Patty and Keisha for um, uh, all the work that you do. And uh, Keisha, thank you for going over the, the middle school piece. Um, I'll, I'll pick up with the high school piece. Um, so uh, we have been uh, working hard in the humanities department um, to uh, engage in PD uh, and curriculum and practice improvement over the past year related to um, issues of racial literacy and, and equity. Uh, we partnered with an organization called Teaching While White, um, which uh, delivered some excellent PD for us over the course of the year. Um, and once that PD had finished, uh, the, uh, the sort of transfer product that the teachers created um, was a, um, a, a set of guiding equity questions um, that we are going to apply uh, to each of our curricula, to each of our units, uh, to make sure that we are creating uh, material, uh, instructional material that uh, is um, equitable and that, that matches all the learning that, that we did. Um, we have been working with a wonderful group of organizations called, a wonderful group of students um, in a student organization called Diversify Our Narrative. Uh, this is a group of uh, students who are advocating for updates. Um, they started with English. We encourage them to expand into social studies. So we are uh, working across both departments. Um, and those students gave us a beautiful presentation about their experiences and their goals. Um, and uh, we have been fortunate to have uh, such insightful student voice uh, along with us. Um, and uh, one other thing to highlight is just the expansion of uh, the racial literacy class, um, which is about to be a graduation requirement, either in the form of Pearl, uh, which I imagine we'll hear more about later uh, from Joy and Patty and all the other folks, um, or in the class itself. Uh, it was very exciting when I got to do sectioning for next year, um, and I saw that enrollment in our racial literacy class had doubled. Um, so instead of having two teachers, uh, we will now have five teachers heading into next year. 
Um, and we are just excited for that to increase uh, year after year. Uh, so I think that brings everyone up to speed on some of the, the major initiatives we've been working on. And without further ado, I will stop talking because I want to make sure that we can give all of our attention to the students. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Stephanie. And we just have to shout out the students because I'm pretty sure it's it's word of mouth that helps get us up to um, being able to double the section size, which is exciting. Absolutely. And so the class, the class um, that we are sharing from tonight is our elective racial literacy class, but there is this new thing that's happening that's an introduction. It's the thing that gets you to the table generally as a result of some trigger. 2020 was a trigger and it brought a lot of people to the table of racial literacy and people wondering, wait a minute now, how do we do this? And so it takes courage to take an introductory class before it's actually required. It takes courage to take an elective class when in terms of a college transcript or a high school transcript review, no one really knows what to do with a racial literacy elective. And so we applaud our students who have taken this class. And so how then do we encourage them to navigate that space? Well, as a result of our class, we hope that they are found their courage to say something, to find other people who are kinfolk with them on this journey, that they can then go into the work of change with joy, without stereotype, without gaze. Now we're, we wanna be clear, sometimes it, it may feel difficult, but it's worth it. And so we present where we were in 2020. This is us. This is Princeton, Prince, uh, Princeton uh, Palmer Square, 2020. This is you, this is them, this is us. This is us a year later, challenging ourselves to expand our conversation about race and racism beyond black white narratives and chattel slavery in the United States, black harm, Latino harm, and be more inclusive, stop flattening. All of these conversations about hate and discrimination and bias, that's domination. Yet this represents progress. How in a year could we do that? Sadly, there has been an expense, a cost that we're fully aware, but we acknowledge the work of not in our town and our community in pushing us through these difficult moments. And so what we as a class did is we put together this, this thing, this collage of headlines and images throughout the year that get us to this place of trying to understand what does racial domination and racial progress look like for us, our class. These are headlines and images that we pulled together to sort of say, this is where we are, this is us. These are the things that we're constantly asking ourselves to think about. And what I'm hopeful that you see is that in spite of the domination, there's plenty of joy our students are recognizing how all of this works together to build change. And of course, when we talk about what the systems are, we leave space for them to decide how they want to share. And so that's where we are and we're super excited. So we're gonna stop talking and make space for our student presentation. This is the order in which our students will make presentations. And just because June has been tough for everyone, um, some students couldn't make it tonight, but we have recordings from those students. So we'll try to alternate hearing from a student in person and then hearing from a student sharing out um, via a recording. But I'm excited to pass it over to Yaila to get us started. So let me share my screen. Okay, Yaila, take it away. Okay, so um, going off of what Dr. BJ was saying about expanding what we, like who we include in our fight for racial justice, um, I 
focused on the Asian American Pacific and Islander uh, community and specifically the model minority myth and how that is harmful. Um, so the model minority myth, uh, I made this, I have the tangible copy like version here, um, but the model minority myth uh, pretty much are at first glance, some people are confused because they think that it, how can this be bad? There are all these stereotypes of being hardworking or being really smart. How can that be a negative thing? However, um, there are multiple ways in which these stereotypes are actually harmful. First, they, um, they um, undermine the hard work that um, Asian people put into what they do. A lot of times, like in schools, it is either assumed or the like the successes of Asian students are solely attributed, attributed to their race. Um, and something that our textbook said on the topic is that these stereotypes make it so that Asian Americans racial attributes uh, take precedence over their personhood. Um, I think this is a really important point in that it just, um, it totally undermines everything that they do and solely attributes it to their race. Um, another thing that, another way in which it is bad is that it continues this, uh, it continues to favor um, a proximity to, to whiteness. So a lot of times minority, the model minority myth will uh, um, view Asians as the closest to white of people of color. And um, this only furthers this, uh, it only furthers this like favoring of a proximity to whiteness as well as also within uh, just like people of color, color as a whole, it creates a racial hierarchy, uh, which further pits different minority groups against each other and makes it harder to mobilize and be able to uh, speak up and work together for racial justice. Um, it also ignores the, the, the discrimination that uh, Asian people have faced in American history. Uh, one example, as you can see, is the a very common example is the Chinese Exclusion Act, which uh, prohibited prohibited um, immigration and naturalization of Chinese people into America in 1852. And, um, and that also, like even in present day, um, Asian Americans are still the Asian Americans are the second like least uh, represented in Hollywood films. Uh, and as we know, um, media and representation in media is extremely important, especially from a young age in how people view themselves and how other people view them as well. And how they are represented is also really important. Um, as well as also um, Asian people are the most underrepresented in government in the US. Uh, with this year with COVID-19, we've seen a huge spike in the in uh, anti-Asian uh, hate crimes. And there was an NYPD report saw that there was a 1900% increase. And so there have been, in some ways, this has um, brought more awareness to the issue of um, just the discrimination that Asian people face in America and uh, has caused a sort of reckoning with everything going on with that community, as well as also pro protests and solidarity with the Asian community. Um, and yes, that, that, that is it. <laughs> Yeah, Ila, just because we brought up diversify our narrative, can you just do a 30 second reflection on uh, Interior Chinatown, which you read in English this year? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. I no worry. It's like 30 seconds or less. Yeah. Um, so, this book recently, Interior Ch Ch Chinatown by Charles Yu, was recently added to uh, the English curriculum, and I read it in my English class. And it really beautifully and subtly, sh and also not subtly, shows different ways in which. Um, 
Asian identity is flattened as well as kind of displays the modern minority myth and how uh, as well that like people of color are divided between themselves because of this proximity to whiteness and it is very good and I highly recommend it. Um, yes. Yaila, thank you for going first and getting us started. We can clap it up. There are some reaction emojis for Yaila. I know you have an early morning. I don't know if you can stay on two minutes. We can uh, utilize the chat feature to ask questions. So that way we can kind of keep it rolling with presentations. Um, and then I know when you have to go, you can take off. But thank you for starting us off. And we are going to move to Grace next. Grace, just let me know how you want me to kind of zoom in and scroll down as you present. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Grace Brown and I am a junior at PHS. Um, my topic is what is medical racism? Medical racism is a form of systematic racism directed towards people of color within the entire healthcare system. Medical racism has been institutionalized in the United States to such an extent that it enables policies that continually exploit and penalize people on the basis of their race or ethnic origins. So how does medical racism affect people today? The CDC found multiple examples of health inequality, inequity for people of color in the United States through a large study on racial and ethnic health disparities in 2015. Black males and females have a lower average life expectancy than white males and females. 10% more black males had high blood pressure than white males and 16% more black females had high blood pressure than white females from 2013 to 14. The study of race as a determinant of health, a systematic review and analysis, found that racism is strongly associated with mental health difficulties contributing to stress, anxiety, and depression. And black women are three to four times more likely to die from pregnancy-related causes than white women. Some more effects is the access to health care. 35% of Latinx adults and 20% of Black adults could not access healthcare insurance compared to 10% of white and Asian adults in 2014. These results are due to racial inequality and racism that exists outside of the healthcare system. This causes economic disparities to exist between racial and ethnic groups in the US, which prevents people of color from accessing health insurance and getting medical care. The history of healthcare. The history that surrounds the development of medicine and healthcare systems in the United States is layered with racial injustice and countless forms of violence against people of color. This includes, but is not limited to, the unequal access to healthcare that persists to the present day, the segregation of medical facilities like hospitals and doctor's office, and the restriction of Black men and women from receiving medical degrees. Coupled with systematic racism that exists outside of medicine, like housing inequalities, generational wealth, employment opportunities, and educational opportunities. This leads to health disparities by race and ethnicity. A continuation of history. Um, the vile history of violence that, is, that Black people faced at the hands of white men and doctors is so important in understanding how mirrored and systematic medical racism is. I found through my research that there is too much information for me to possibly include in proper detail in my presentation to you tonight. So I've included some sources if you would like to learn more. While researching, it was very heartbreaking for me to um, read all the sources that I found. And I couldn't, I found that it would be an injustice for me to simply list um, ev everything that I found. So I have some sources and keywords for you if you would like to further expand your knowledge. Um, yeah, you can scroll down. So the fallacy of racial differences. As of June 2nd in 2021, the NFL has declared that they will no longer assume racial differences among athletes when treating brain injuries. The NFL used to use a practice of race norming which assumed that black athletes had lower brain functions and would curve their cognitive test scores when assessing brain injuries. This had a large impact on the ability of black retirees to receive rewards under compensation. And there was recently a large settlement that disbanded the practice of the race norming for the NFL. And this is just a simple step in rewriting medical practices that work on the basis of racial differences. And the 
idea that there are biological differences between humans of different races, I just want to be very clear that that is a fallacy and completely not true. So it's really important when understanding the history of medical racism and how that affects people today that everyone is biologically the same. So for per perceived pain bias, the perceived pain bias is the belief that people of color, specifically black people, experience less pain than their white counterparts. Systematically, black Americans are undertreated for their pain relative to white Americans. And through a study conducted by the University of Virginia, it was shown that white medical students who believe the fallacy that there are biological differences between blacks and whites regarding pain were more likely to rate the black patient's pain as lower and make less accurate treatment recommendations compared to the white patients. And this has impacts in the medical care system because um, people of color would like not be treated the same, which is not good. And we do not want that. Um, so with emergency care, a study on race, race and ethnicity and geographic access to urban trauma care found that areas that are predominantly black were more likely than areas that are predominantly white to be located in a trauma desert. And a trauma desert is an area where the distance to the nearest adult level one or two trauma center is greater than five miles. And so in addition to limited access, people of color face racial biases that may prevent them from receiving emergency medical care. Doctors in emergency departments are less likely to classify black and Latinx children as requiring emergency care compared to white or Asian children, admit black or Latinx children to the hospital after visiting the emergency department and order blood tests, CT scans or x-rays for black, Latinx or Asian children compared to white children according to a Frontiers in Pediatric study on racial disparities in emergency care among children. So um, the impacts of COVID-19, a study conducted in May 2020 estimated that people, black people were 3.5 times more likely to die from COVID-19 than white people in America. And the Latinx population was found to have a 1.88 times higher risk of death than white patients. The study, which was led by Dr. Gross, stated that the disparities may be attributed to the increased burden that people of color face in respect to comorbidities, incarceration, and a decreased access to medical resources and healthcare. COVID-19 has had disproportionate effects on racial and ethnic minority groups in America, which has shined a light on larger problems within the healthcare system, such as systematic racism. This has prom prompted the CDC to release a statement in April of 2021, where they acknowledged that racism is a system that has a profound and negative impact on communities of color. And um, basically their acknowledgement of this was like a good step forward in racial progress, although they did not state anything that they would be doing to help combat this. I included this picture because um, through the racial literacy class, it's just as equally important to talk about racial domination as it is to talk about racial progress and to rethink and rewrite the ways in which we can help combat it. So um, here it's like the differences between inequality, equality, equity, and justice. And then I have one last slide for us tonight. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so um, I'm sorry this presentation is long. It, there's so much about this that I, even so much more that I couldn't even include. So um, yes, uninsured rates by race and ethnicity. Um, this graph shows how the Affordable Care Act, which was created to reduce the cost of health insurance coverage for those in need, has positively affected people of color in the United States by enabling them to access health insurance. This is an example of racial progress because there were large coverage gains for groups of color under the ACA. Um, the Affordable Care Act was um, signed into law in 2010 by Obama and in 2014, um, the ACA Medicaid and marketplace coverage expansions were implemented, which is why you see um, a decrease in the uninsured rates in 2014. And so the coverage gains under the ACA reduced percent 
point differences in uninsured rates between some groups of color and whites, but disparities still remained. As of 2018, most groups of color were still more likely to be uninsured compared to whites. And one thing that is interesting to note is that even though uninsured rates for all groups of color um, like decreased, the relative difference between some groups of color and whites remained the same. For example, blacks remained 1.5 times more likely to be uninsured than whites from 2018 to, four, to 2000, from 2010 to 2018, and Hispanics um, uninsured value remained over 2.5 times higher than the value than the rate of whites. The whole, um, <laughs> the okay. And um, so, Sorry, Grace, I, we accidentally did a mute all there. Okay. That's okay, you're good, go ahead. <laughs> um, so what can we do? Um, we can scroll down a little. One of the main ways to decrease these disparities is to help enroll people who are eligible in Medicare and marketplace coverage. However, this can be difficult because eligibility, eligibility varies by racial and ethnic groups. Um, Affordable Care Act coverage does not reach everyone within these groups and coverage differs state by state. Research has shown that having health insurance impacts one's ability to get medical care, which ultimately impacts their overall health. America's healthcare system fundamentally depends on insurance and groups of color are historically less likely than whites to be insured, which directly leads to the systematic means of medical racism. Because of this, one way that we can combat this would be to create federal legislation that would decrease coverage gaps and enable more people across to access insurance. And um, because there are challenges within the system, another way to effectively narrow disparities would be to reform the system. If we were to rework the structure of the healthcare system to be fundamentally for the people instead of for big companies such as Big Pharma, we could create a system that promotes justice and equitability for all. The way that lobbying works. So lobbying is um, a tactic used by Big Pharma and um, lobbying work. The way that lobbying works means that we are creating healthcare decisions based on profit margins instead of what would be most beneficial to the people. Another reform idea is Medicaid, Medicare for All, which was one of Bernie Sanders' main campaign points. And he believes that healthcare is a human right. Right now, more than 30 million Americans do not have health insurance. And I believe that one of the contributing factors to this stark number is the lack of available help our government would rather gain profits for themselves than actually create and pass legislation that will help the people. Reforming the healthcare system is about policy change because what we have now is a for-profit system that is not for the people. Grace, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Um, if, if you can stay on for another minute, if there are any questions for Grace or feedback, feel free to drop it in the chat. Grace, I know you've got dinner coming up with your family. Say hi to your sister. Okay, um, thank you so much. Yeah, of course. And great. And so we are going to switch over to one of our students um, who is presenting via a recording. I just wanna pull up um, in advance. Here is a link to the site that Annie has created. So as she presents, she'll be pulling up some of the links from her page. And so if you'd like to dive a little bit deeper on your own, uh, the link to the page that she's presenting here is in the chat. Okay. Hello, my name is Annie Wong. And sorry, I can't make it to the meeting today, but I'd love to share what I made for this project with you guys. Um, so. The title of my project is called Books, Stories, and Diversity. And basically that's what it's about. Um, it's about diversity in books, um, children's books and um, adult books alike, and just diversity in the publishing industry as well. So um, I'll put, I'll send the link to the website to um, Mr. Manhart and Dr. BJ. So hopefully they can share it with you guys. Thank you so much. Um, so basically, first I have a short introduction about diversity in children's books and just these two infographics that I found um, which showcase the progress we made and um, like how much we still need. And then I have a section on 
uh, diversity in the workplace. A very short history about um, about that from World War II um, until the civil rights movement. And I also talked a little bit about affirmative action and just the criticism <clears throat> is being um, facing. And then uh, I dive into diversity in the publishing industry, which does not include writers, but we will touch base upon that later. Um, so this is a very uh, informative graph and I just found it fascinating. So basically there's 76% uh, white people in the industry and 74% cis women and 81% who, who are straight and 89% who are non-disabled. So there are, so I just found, if you click on this link, we'll see, this is a graph that Ms. Manhart and Dr. BJ showed us very early in um, our racial literacy um, class. And basically the publishing industry reflect literally every aspect that's um, in the position of domination. And it's just found it really interesting, but also not surprising. And then um, besides the in, um, industry overall graph, there are also executive level editorial and interns and a couple of others, but I just chose these three because they showcase like a particular problem that are facing the industry right now. Um, for example, um, women are still facing a glass ceiling uh, when it comes to um, the higher position, like the executive level. And then in editorial, we see <clears throat> the percentage of POC editors drastically decrease. And then in interns, um, this is the one that made me really angry <laughs> because um, it's just very clear how much the lowest position is reserved for women, people of color, LGBTQ plus people, and those with disabilities. And the next I have um, this section particularly about POC authors and their struggles. So this is, um, if you click on the graph, it leads you to a really well-written article with lots of sorts of data about um, just how white the um, book industry is. It dives into the publishing industry as well, but I think it's mostly focused on the writers. And so we see that only 11% of fiction books in 2018 were written by people of color, which is just very problematic. And I think this problem is sometimes obscured by um, like literary prices featuring um, books written by people of color. And that just gave a false, I guess, a conception that this is not that big of a problem. Which, is it, which it definitely is. Next section is about um, the pay inequality and the pay gap between Black and non-Black authors. This is created by writer L.L. McKinney and it's called hashtag um, publishing paid me. And I found a bunch of tweets that was um, in the beginning when the hashtag started and I think one thing one thing that I really that really caught my attention is the one by N.K. Uh, Jemison. I loved her book, The Broken Nerds uh, Trilogy, and seeing this and connecting that to how I love the book is just kind of shocking. So you can see um, the comparison here, and then um, so here. I have, if you click here, I have some further readings that I won't dive too much into. So some uh, videos about more presentation in children's books. This article that I found about uh, the gender balance, well, gender imbalance uh, of the New York Times um, bestseller list. Okay, click here to the article. And then another essay that talks of, uh, that's written by Zora Neale Hurston called what why publishers won't print. And then there are three uh, really great organizations that I found supporting minority and uh, minority authors, authors. So yeah, that's basically what I had um, prepared for this project. And yeah, 
hopefully you guys will enjoy it and learn something from it. I definitely learned a lot. So yeah, thank you. And so Annie is not on the call tonight, but if you have feedback that you would like to share with Annie, you can put it in the chat and we'll pass on those messages. Um, and Dr. Burns Johnson, I just have to say, like we give students, you know, nuggets, like we give them a little bit or ideas or some resources and then to see everything that they find is always so amazing. Um, yeah, so it's always a highlight. We are gonna hear from one more uh, student recording before switching back to a student in person. And so this is from Layla on voting rights. My name is Layla and I did my progress on tracking progression and domination within voting rights and looking at how it relates to race. So the first thing I did was I looked at Voting Rights Act and Voting Rights Act amendments to see how the law was kind of playing into, into this. So I started with the Voting Rights Act in 1965, and this was one of the first times that the government was kind of playing a role into limiting, or, you know, into leading towards racial progression within voting rights. So, for example, um, the Voting Rights of Act of 1965 suspended literary devices and voter disqualification for five years, and it had federal examiners to supervise voting to obviously, you know, make sure things were going smoothly, and it took very serious action against people who violated um, the rules. Um, in 1970, the amendment lowered the voting age from 18 to 21, and you'll see in a couple minutes I'll explain a case that... Um, had a lot of controversy over this. It also forbade the usage of literary tests at polls, and this was a really important one for racial progression in terms of voting rights, because a lot of people that were voting were not um, as fluent in the English language and as, you know, you know, versed in this as others. It gave them a really unfair, unfair disadvantage, so this part of the Voting Rights Act amendment was really important for racial progression. It also restricted states from voting back, excuse me, from blocking voters from voting based on where they lived. So 1975, Voting Rights Act amendments expanded the Voting Rights Act of 1965 for seven years. More minorities were covered under it and literary tests were permanently banned. Again, these literary tests were incredibly important for racial progression in terms of voting, um, as I explained a second ago. The amendments of 1982, so it extended the act of 1965 by 25 years. It offered financial aid for the disabled and the illiterate. This is the first time that in heavily minority population, bilingual election materials were used. So again, this is just offering um, people aid that they need and it's just like blatant um, progression, racial progression in terms of voting. So 2006, most recent, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 is extended by 25 years. The bilingual election guidelines were extended until 2032, so we're currently still under them. And the U.S. Controller General had to report back to Congress, um, had to give them feedback on these bilingual election materials. So again, um, just clear um, progression. Um, so what I did was I looked at ways that it was challenged through Supreme Court cases. So I only looked at three and there are many others, um, but I just, I just focused, focused on these three and looked to see how it related to progression and um, reversal um, based on the Voting Rights Act and amendments. The first one was South Carolina versus Kadenbach, and I'm hoping that I'm saying that correctly. This was in 1966, so just a year after the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was passed. It was basically saying that this Voting Rights Act violated the Constitution and gave Congress too much power. So again, right off the bat, after this act was passed, it was trying to um, kind of take back, you know, kind of take a step back. But the courts did rule that it was constitutional, so progress continued. So this was, this was a win for um, voting rights, for racial progression, total win. In 1970, a little bit later, Oregon v. Mitchell, Oregon sued saying that the 1970 amendments interfered with state powers according to the constitution. So too much power. Um, it was also was very um, controversial with lowering the voting age to 18. This was also a um, little bit of a problem. So the decision ended up being that it was fine for them to regulate federal elections, but not state or local elections. This was kind of in the middle between progress and domination because like it wasn't exactly progress, but it wasn't act exactly a step back. Um, so it was kind of, kind of in the middle. This one's, this one's a little tricky. 
So most recently, I looked at Shelby versus Holder. So this was in 2013, so very recently. Shelby County in Alabama filed a lawsuit claiming that Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act was unconstitutional. So basically what Section 5 does is it, pro it protects uh, minority voters who live um, in jurisdictions with a history of discrimination from voting laws being popped off on them without, you know, you can't just spring a voting law in a jurisdiction with a history of discrimination is basically what Section 5 says. And the Supreme Court ruled it as unconstitutional, saying it was outdated. So I put an image at the bottom just showing you that the judges voted along party lines. Um, this was a clear example of progress being reversed. Um, and just interesting to see that it was so recent and so obviously um, reversing progress, racial progress in voting. So I had to just put a little thing in there about uh, voter suppression. So 2020 was a time um, that we saw a lot of voter suppression, um, particularly in communities um, of minorities. So for example, just to name a few, in convenient polling locations, you have to travel a lot farther than you should have to. Um, felons had to pay off all their fees before they were even allowed to vote. Um, very long lines, long waits, a lot of people couldn't receive water, couldn't hand out water. It was hard to vote by mail for some people and voter ID requirements were very strict for others. So again, just suppressing that vote, particularly in a lot of minority communities. This is obviously taking a step back. And those are some of my sources. So um, thank you everyone for listening. And Layla's presentation is just a really good reflection of how responsive this class needs to be. Um, we rely heavily on inquiry-based learning because this issue is something that was changing by the week, by the month. We have to pay attention to what states are rolling out which laws post-2020 election. Um, so it's I appreciate that Layla took sort of this direction for her research because it is something that is um, sort of morphing as we go, which is, you know, it, it's exciting to have a class that we need to sort of be on the pulse at all times with what's happening. Um, same suggestion, if you have feedback for Layla, you can leave that in the chat and we'll pass it on during class tomorrow. Uh, we are moving on to Stella's presentation next. So Stella, just let me know how you'd like me to advance the slide as you go. Hi, I'm Stella, and I'm going to be talking about the intersection of art, identity, and social justice. So you can go to the next slide. So um, my project is going to focus on artists who you use art to express their identity or their racial identity and how they use it for social justice in the world. So historically, art has been a predominantly white field. Approximately 85% of artworks in museums are by white artists. And today, 76% of artists that are able to use their art to make a living are white. One out of five working artists identify as white and 84 museum staff, 84% of museum staff are white. So this is why in my project, I'm going to be highlighting artists of color who, and I'm gonna be looking at how they express racial identity through their work and how they use their art to as activism to influence the public either on social media or in galleries or murals. And yeah, next slide. So the first one is Kara Walker and she grew up in Georgia, so she faced a lot of adversity growing up because she was Black and in the Deep South. So she used her experiences to create her art, which is why themes are race, gender, and violence. And she is known for her silhouette figures that you can see in the picture here, which depict scenes of the antebell antebellum South and is trying to call out racist histories and bring attention to the African-American experience from the perspective of an African-American who lives in the Deep South. So at the bottom, you can see a quote from the artist herself. And some other things to note are that she was called one of time's most influential people because she was able to use her personal experience in her art and be relatable to other African-Americans. Next is Bisa Butler, and she has work at the Art Institute of Chicago, 
and she was a trained painter at Howard University and then became a high school art teacher. So she likes to celebrate Black life through her art and bring attention to the everyday culture. And she is inspired by her own family as well as historical Black figures. And she wants to highlight influential yet overlooked African Americans. And she does this through vibrant colors and quilts and textiles. And her portrait of Nobel Peace Prize winner, um, I'm sorry if I pronounced this wrong, but Lorette Wingari Maatai was featured as a cover for Times Magazine special issue honoring the 100 Women of the Year in 2020. Next is Yahimi Cambron. And she is a Peruvian native who immigrated to the United States. And she really likes to use her experience to create art. So she uses murals like you can see here. And this is through an organization called Living Walls, which they say seeks to utilize the power of public art as a social and economic engine. And this takes place in the community of Atlanta. And she likes to give representation in her art to children of color because she feels that they are underrepresented. And she uses the monarch butterfly as a symbol for migration. And this is a good example of using murals as activism because they reach a very large audience. So this is Irvin A. Johnson, and he is um, a college educated artist who has also had a lot of artist residencies. And he is very inspired by the Black Lives Matter movement and is using his art to fight against police brutality and fight for racial equality. And he um, paints a lot of um, people who have died because of police brutality. And he wants to use art as a platform to renegotiate Black identity and its place in history. And so he is displayed in multiple art galleries across the US. And he wants to get his work out as widely as possible um, in order to fight for human rights and social issues, which is why um, his website, he uses a lot of that too, to reach a larger audience. This is Shirin Nishat, and she was born in Iran, but left during the revolution with her father, and she was able to study art in Los Angeles. And she found that in the United States, because of their Western values, which she more identified with, she was able to express herself through art in the way she wanted, which she wouldn't have been allowed to do in Iran. So she deals with a lot of race, feminism, and Islamic politics. And she likes to highlight um, female warriors in the Islamic revolution. So the last artist I'm going to talk about today is Pasita Abad who is a Filipina American. So she has worked in over 70 countries and she was born in the Philippines, but moved to the United States to study art. And while studying art, she supported herself through working small jobs. And she is famous for representing women of the Philippines and wanted to raise awareness through her paintings. And so she's um, really inspired by social interactions and politics and likes to capture social realism and how racial identity can play a role in the community. So this last slide here is about just more information and people to follow on Instagram. So that's all, thank you. Stella, thank you so much. Um, we start with a unit on aesthetics and art. And I think it's because Dr. Burns Johnson is it your favorite unit. My, like it's just one of our favorites. So um, Stella, we love seeing your expansion of our understanding Our, you know, you're introducing us to new artists with your work. So thank you so much for this. We like, we like to start with joy. 
because we know the pain that's coming. <laughs> <laughs> we have one more student recording. We might cut a little bit short just for timing and then we'll hear from one more student on the call before we wrap things up tonight. Hi, I'm Victoria Safan, and today I'm going to be talking about racism in the fashion industry and going over an infographic about the topic that I made with Esco Gorbiaco. So up top, I have a statistic about the demographic makeup of the world's garment workers. So 80% of the world's 74 million garment workers are women of color. And workers in the fashion industry face a lot of exploitation and work under very unsafe working conditions, which is important to highlight because this is mainly people of color that are being exploited by these brands. Um, and they're exploited in many ways, through their wages, through their hours, through the physical conditions that they work under. So it's important to um, note all of these different forms of exploitation and how they're all sort of detrimental to the lives of people of color globally. So very low, frankly, unlivable wages are commonplace in the fashion industry. A study, gone, sorry, a study done in the UK revealed that garment workers are being paid $5 an hour, and in Bangladesh, the minimum wage for a garment worker is around $63 per month. So both of these wages, the $5 in the UK and the $63 per month in Bangladesh, are clearly not even enough to sustain one person's basic needs, let alone sustain a whole family, which is often what a lot of these government workers are attempting to do. They're trying to put food on the table for themselves and other people with a wage that wouldn't even be enough to sustain themselves. And in addition to their very low wages, government workers also are forced to work very long shifts, often 14 to 16 hours, seven days a week. And this can get even larger if there's like a garment quota coming up or a deadline for the fashion brand. And because they have such low wages, uh, these workers are more likely to work overtime because they need the extra money to be able to support themselves or their families. And on top of that, a lot of garment workers experience frequent harassment from um, factory managers or other employees. So 60% of female garment workers in Cambodia said that they've been made to feel uncomfortable or unsafe at work. And on top of all these other issues, there's also structural problems with the factories that these garment workers are working in. They're often not structurally sound and they're prone to collapse because of all the heavy equipment inside, prone to fires. There's been a lot of devastating fires that have killed hundreds of garment workers and the fashion brands that use these factories are often not held accountable for the deaths of these people, which is a whole different issue. Um, but yeah, on top of that, there's often no emergency exits and the doors are frequently locked or like barred shut to deter theft. Um, but that means that garment workers cannot exit in, the, in, in like time of an emergency. One moment. Sorry about that. So this is important to highlight because many fashion brands, mainly based in the US and UK, export their labor to areas uh, like developing areas such as Southeast Asia and Africa in order to take advantage of the people of color in those countries who are not protected by stricter laws to enforce fair pay or safety. And so yeah, people of color are being subjected to exploitation and very unsafe working conditions in the name of fast fashion. And on top of the detrimental effects that this industry has upon the lives of people of color in terms of, like, directly, their workers, they also affect the lives of people of color with um, the environmental effects of the fashion industry because it connects to environmental racism. So each year, over 100 billion new garments are produced by the fashion industry. And these garments enter a short cycle. They are sold, worn a couple times. This mainly applies to fast fashion. And then they are donated to thrift stores or immediately end up in a landfill. Um, the United States also exports a lot of clothing that doesn't get sold in thrift stores to developing nations. So they can re-enter the cycle in a way. They'll be worn a couple times and then again they end up in a landfill in, just in another nation. But in addition to the physical waste that this industry produces, um, the fast fashion industry also produces about 1.2 billion tons of carbon, carbon dioxide per year, 
which is devastating to our atmosphere and just speeds up climate change. And people of color are most susceptible to the environmental effects of the fashion industry because of environmental racism, which if you don't know what that is, it's when people of color or communities of color are closer in proximity to hazardous environmental pollutants or... or no. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, pollutants or polluted water, polluted air, toxic waste facilities. Um, mainly pe people of color are closer to those areas than their white counterparts. And it's important to note that the environmental racism from the fashion industry doesn't only stem from the waste products of it, it also starts at the factory. So in the factories, women of color primarily are being exposed to toxic fumes and risk inhaling fabric dust, which can cause serious health issues for not only them, but their children. Um, and the larger environmental effects of the fashion industry, such as lower air quality and dye polluted waters, are experienced mainly by communities of color, again, because of environmental racism. So down here I have a graphic showing um, environmental racism in the United States in terms of pollutants. Um, again, this is specific to the United States, but it still is very relevant. So Latinx Americans are exposed to 63% more pollution than they produce. Black Americans are exposed to 56% more pollution than they produce. And their white counterparts are exposed to 17% less pollution than they produce. And this phenomena could be observed in terms of all hazardous environmental issues, not only just pollutants. And we're going to have to pause, but I think, uh, Dr. BJ, maybe we can share the infographic to get to this last piece of, of what's being done. Um, but I'm just looking at the time and um, I think the cicadas in the background might have slowed down that <laughs> student recording, which is OK, it happens. Um, but I think that we're going to wrap tonight uh, hearing from Taylor Faith sharing a poem with us. So Taylor Faith, would you like to unmute yourself and share? Yes, ma'am. So my poem is titled, To Whom Do We Call? And initially it was a poem that I had written freshman year. However, I have done some self-reflection since I have taken racial literacy and I have rewritten the poem. So let me pull this up. To whom do we call? Cries of the oppressed, the imprisoned, the prosecuted, and the martyred. To whom do we call? I'm painted in the pigment of my ancestors, my very flesh a threat to the fabric of this nation, a nation in which I must call my home. To whom do we call? Criminalized for vocalizing the terror inflicted upon our people daily, still all we ask for is equality. My liberty given by not those who govern, but by the blood of the enslaved indoctrinated to believe that our pain has subsided 165 years ago, exploited by media, our grief commercialized by corporations, our tears politicized, mocked, and ridiculed, cries of the oppressed, a cry that I refuse to ignore. To whom do we call and will they ever respond? Thank you. So I will simply say, um, family, those of you who are here, we see you as family. This, this is that village that we need as educators to grow our own change agents. If you were able to join the Not In Our Town conversation last night, the comments by Reverend Lucata um, were amazing because he said, we're not looking at a future generation we're looking at the now generation of people who are changing the landscape of social justice in Princeton. There is no doubt in our minds that the students that navigate our schools and navigate our course are changed as a result of the requirements that we have that number one, they come with this open mind and that they be willing to form community and that they have to do this thing right here. Perhaps not right here in this moment, but that they convert all of the learnings that we have had into something. It's been great for us to see in the chat all the comments about um, our class. And so 
Uh, Patty and I are going to be here to sort of field conversations so that if you have questions for us, you can do that. I want to acknowledge um, Taylor Faith, who was in our fall 2020 section, and say thank you, Ms. McKee, for coming back. Stella, thank you for your brilliant representations. And I think most of the other students have left for the evening, but can we all just do some kind of reactions to celebrate the youth as they have presented so brilliantly the work that we've done all year? Yay! Woo! Woo! Yes. So, are there any questions? We can put questions in the chat or just go ahead and unmute. All right, so I guess I think the, the question that a lot of people are wondering about is the Pearl course. And so I wanted to uh, take only about three minutes <laughs> to explain um, the Princeton Introduction to Racial Literacy course. In this time, I think it's really important that people recognize that we believe firmly that racial literacy like language literacy, like mathematical numeracy, or any type of disciplinary knowledge is necessary in a community as diverse as ours. It's not so much because we're only racially diverse, but because we are ideolo ideologically diverse. Believe it or not, most of the people in our community are more similar in their beliefs about certain very difficult conversations than they want to admit because racial and ethnic diversity seem to be the major litmus test for our differences. And so the Pearl course, Princeton Introduction to Racial Literacy doesn't actually start with race. That course starts with yourself. It's a, it's a scrutiny of your values and your understanding about who you are. And in the words of um, Queen Mother, Toni Morrison, it challenges every person that takes the course to ask themselves, are you strong only because I'm on my knees? That question by itself transcends the, the question of race. And, and jogs us into sort of understanding our class, our gender, our able-bodiedness, our ability, our access, and the ways that we think. 2020 and 2021 have been particularly challenging, not so much because we learned anything new about this nation, but I think they were most challenging because we learned most about ourselves. Being forced to be in tight spaces with people and separated from those things that allow us to be free, whatever that looks like, really created the crucible that we saw. 2020 didn't start in 2020. 2020 didn't start in 2016. 2016 didn't start in the 21st century. And so one of the biggest challenges that we face, I think, as educators in this space is to make sure that um, we truthfully examine the roots of racial domination and racial progress, which ultimately means we take the time to examine ourselves and what we gain when other people lose. And so, it is with that that I simply say, um, this has been one of the biggest joys and delights of our day for the last three years. Ms. Manhart and I get to work in close conversation and we are transformed most by our students. Um, 
And so we thank you for spending the evening with us um, and taking the time to sort of um, engage in more Zoom. Um, and so uh, I really appreciate Not In Our Town. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Mickey, for your continued support. Thank you, Kim. And to all of those who come back year after year to see how we are growing. And, and, so and Dr. B, oh, I didn't want to cut you off, but I also didn't want to run out of time. There were a few questions in the chat that I was trying to fire off by typing, but if you wanted to add any thoughts um, from Jay Franco, what's been the most difficult part of teaching this class um, from Miss Linda? Uh, can we talk about the revision process from year to year? And then from Michelle, uh, was there a design process used in teaching this course? Um, I just shared that the revision is, is constant. Um, as we continue to grow, that's also one of the most challenging pieces to always have to be on our toes and reflective and updating our lessons. And then as for the design, I just kind of looked to our, our text, which was sort of our backbone to, to start as the jumping off point for our curriculum. But I'd love to hear your thoughts and ideas before we wrap. But you said it all. Okay, no, so I'm just checking. <laughs> no, 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 the, the book the book is a wonderful guide. So the framework of domination and progress is based in our book uh, by Matthew Desmond and Mustafa Emmerbeyer, which presents a very um, balanced way for us to consider race. Uh, and yeah, we 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 thought that we were set, right? We got this, but we changed the class every single semester, every single semester. Do you think the course has changed? This is Michelle Top Ponder. Sorry, I should put Michelle. on the racial dynamic in the school. Ooh, you know, so you're making me think of data, <laughs> which is not my favorite part of being a teacher. I hope that's not bad to admit in front of somebody on our school board. Um, <laughs> but that's so hard to, to measure. Um, I, I, what I've seen is that each year the students come to us sort of elevated in, in the language that they have, the knowledge that they have, sort of the, the background. So kind of each year the students kick us up a notch. Um, so then I can imagine that that's reflective for the kids as they exit out. But I've just noticed the students, you know, coming into the course just start at kind of this higher and higher um, space each year, some each semester. Dr. BJ? I think... Yes, the students come higher because, because of our class, our colleagues are more responsive. And I see that many more of our colleagues are willing to touch some of the topics more frequently. Um, are we at a point where I think our school is completely changed? No, I still think that there's a lot of work to be done, but yes our student populations. Do you see the presentations? And for those of you who've been here year after year, I, I mean, every year they get mm -hmm. more intense and, and that's great and that's, that's good. And so uh, a broader vision, now that Keisha is talking about elementary, okay, 10 years from now, we're going to be able to host a symposium on par with any university. Any university. And I firmly believe that. I firmly believe that we will be able to have sociologists prepared to sort of uh, engage discourse at a very meaningful level. I think that um, there's a lot on the horizon for us. Well, it's fantastic. And I, and I have seen the, from year to year, from when I first started four years ago, light years difference in terms of the level of sophistication and the depth of analysis and really taking on some really tough topics that are data heavy and, yeah. and, and really sophisticated for, for, these, for kids at these levels, at this level. So it's fantastic. Thank well, you. Michelle, I also have to say thank you because I work in a school district where I don't have to be afraid of getting into, you know, quote unquote, tough conversations because I, I know who our school board is, where you are. Um, so thank you. You know, I have a, my cousin is a junior. She goes to school in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I stay in close contact with her with how that's going. So it's just so different to be at Princeton. And um, I'm really thankful for that. So thank you for your ongoing support of this work. We'll keep trying. <laughs>
This is uh, Shelly Krause. I'm one of the members of the Not In Our Town board. I wanna add my voice to the chorus of admiration and gratitude for these teachers and these uh, extraordinary young people um, who in so many ways are leading the rest of us in, in the ways forward. Um, I want to just once again lift up in gratitude the names of our youth presenters tonight. Yaila, who spoke about uh, the pernicious effects of the myth of a model minority. Um, Grace, who lifted up racial disparities in access policies and outcomes in health and medicine. Annie, who dove into the diversity or lack of diversity in the publishing industry and the gatekeeping that goes on there. Uh, Layla, who bravely uh, forged forward into the changing under our feet landscape of voting rights and voter suppression. Um, Stella, who brought forward some beautiful uh, examples of folks who are working in the space of art, identity, and social justice in those interactions and intersections. And Victoria, who's um, who's looking at who, whose look at racism in the fashion industry uh, should really be a call to all of us to take a look at our closets. And finally, I, I just want to say, uh, Taylor Faith, what a beautiful thing to say. I wrote something. I thought something. I believe something. And then I changed. I mean, that isn't a message for how we all need to move forward. I don't mm. know what is. You right about that. Mm. So mm. I just I I want to uh, you know as I said I'm, I'm I know I'm speaking for everyone when I say thank you so much. Uh, I I know we're losing folks now because people are getting hungry and they have kids to put to bed and other things going on. So let me just quickly say uh, that if you're feeling like I want to keep having this conversation, prepare yourself to continue to have this conversation. Think about the people in your lives with whom you could or should be having this conversation uh, and. Think about uh, your next opportunity here with Not In Our Town and our partners, our wonderful partners here at the Princeton Public Library next month, July 5th, Monday. Again, uh, shift your thinking a little bit in terms of timing because we're going to have a two-part event starting with a community reading of the Frederick, the famous Frederick Douglass speech, uh, What to the Slave is the 4th of July, and that's happening at 530 so from 5.30 to 6.30, a community reading. And then, uh, and then we'll have a presentation and uh, discussion led by Caroline, our own uh, Caroline Clark from Not In Our Town, uh, subsequent to that in the usual uh, Not In Our Town time slot. So um, once again, thank you so much. There's a reason that this event is one that folks in the Not In Our Town family look forward to for uh, months and months. So uh, thank you again, and please uh, come on back and see us again in July. <laughs>